This is a brief video on ectopic pregnancy or pregnancy occurring outside the uterus. We're going to be given a brief overview of ectopic pregnancy, talking about how it presents in the clinic, talking about some causes or risk factors of ectopic pregnancy, talking about how to diagnose ectopic pregnancies and one diagnostic algorithm, as well as talking about how to manage ectopic pregnancy once it's been diagnosed. Before we begin, this is an image of a well-preserved specimen from an ectopic pregnancy that is about seven weeks in gestation. The specimen was preserved in a fallopian tube, and you can see the fallopian tube surrounding what looks like a well-preserved human embryo that is about seven weeks old. So let's begin with an overview of ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy is by definition when the embryo attaches outside of the uterus. Embryo can attach in several locations. It most commonly occurs in the ampulla of the fallopian tube as shown right there where my pointer is pointing. It can also occur in other parts of the tube, closer to the fimbriae. It can occur in the ovary, it can occur in the cervix, it can occur in the myometrium, an interstitial ectopic pregnancy, or even outside of the tubes in the abdomen, an intra-abdominal pregnancy. So it can occur in various locations, most commonly in the ampulla of the fallopian tube. Ectopic embryos can grow and create pressure or invade surrounding structures. So if an ectopic pregnancy grows inside the uterus or inside the tube, it can block the tube and create pressure on either side. It can affect surrounding organs and structures and cause pain, pressure, or bleeding that way as well. How does it present in the clinic? Usually have symptoms. The classic symptoms are abdominal or pelvic pain and vaginal bleeding. The pain can be described as sharp, dull, and or crampy, so not super descriptive, but it often mimics appendicitis, especially when it's on the lower right side, uh, when it's on that right adnexa, that right fallopian tube. The bleeding usually occurs six weeks after the last menstrual period, so it's usually a first trimester finding, um, and, and the patient might have bleeding because of an ectopic pregnancy. Other symptoms include a tender cervix, an adnexal mass that's found on physical exam, or adnexal tenderness. You might also see some symptoms of pregnancy. Because this is a pregnancy, it's just in the wrong location. And those include nausea, vomiting, urination, fatigue, and breast tenderness. And those are usually the result of high HCG in the body. Another sign is a destruction or rupture of the fallopian tube. And if there's a rupture of the fallopian tube, you might get peritonitis. You might get abdominal distension, generalized tenderness, peritonitis. And if there really is a lot of blood loss into the peritoneum or outside the body through the vagina, you might also get hypovolemic shock and the symptoms associated with that, which include low blood pressure, high heart rate, and a cold feeling, hypovolemic shock. Now, the causes and risk factors of ectopic pregnancy mainly revolve around damage to the fallopian tubes and or the hair-like cilia on the inner surface of the tubes. And all of these kind of relate to damage to the fallopian tubes in some way. In pelvic inflammatory disease, there's an inflammatory process surrounding the fallopian tubes, salpingitis, which can result in scarring. This is the most common cause and risk factor of ectopic pregnancy. Another risk factor is infertility. People who are infertile are more likely to have ectopic pregnancies. Um, the theory is that the damage to the tubes causes both the infertility and the ectopic pregnancy. So similar cause. IUDs are associated with ectopic pregnancy. Exposure to DES is associated. Tubal surgeries like tubal ligation is associated with ectopic pregnancy. Intrauterine surgeries like DNC, which damage the endometrium, are also associated with ectopic pregnancies. Smoking is associated with many things, one of which is ectopic pregnancy. And previous ectopic pregnancies are a big risk factor for future ectopic pregnancies. Endometriosis is another one. Now the diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy. Before we talk about that diagnostic algorithm, we're gonna be showing a couple images of diagnostic techniques. Shown here is a transvaginal ultrasound. You can see the ultrasound transducer inserted into the vagina this way and looking up through the cervix and the uterus that way. This gives you a pretty direct view of the cervix, the uterus, the ovary, and the tube where the ectopic pregnancy is most likely to happen. Notice that the bladder is anterior to the uterus and the rectum would be posterior. 
to the uterus. So this is a vaginal transducer used in some obstetric clinics. Um, it can be helpful in diagnosing ectopic pregnancy. This is an image of an actual ultrasound where you see the blob or mass that is the ectopic pregnancy. Um, it's important to differentiate this mass from the ovary. They both look pretty similar, but the ovary is distinct because it has follicles. You can see it has like a texture where you see follicles and the, and the ectopic pregnancy does not have that texture. Now for the diagnostic algorithm. If you suspect an ectopic pregnancy based on the presentation, the symptoms and signs that we discussed earlier, you want to do two tests. You want to do an ultrasound and a beta HCG. Begin with the ultrasound. You can use a transabdominal or a transvaginal ultrasound, as we saw. If the ultrasound shows a gestational sac present in the uterus, you know that it's not ectopic pregnancy because that's where the gestational sac is supposed to be. If the ultrasound shows a gestational sac elsewhere, you know that it is an ectopic pregnancy because by definition, that is an ectopic pregnancy. This sign might be called a ring of fire sign, and it's often helpful to use Doppler because you'll see increased vascular flow to the adnexa. That would diagnose ectopic pregnancy. Usually the ultrasound isn't too helpful and you don't see a gestational sac. And that's when you have to do your second test, the serum HCG. If you do a serum HCG and it is above 2000, you treat like an ectopic pregnancy. You should be able to see an intrauterine pregnancy if the serum HCG is that high. Um, now the cutoff for what is too high usually ranges between 1500 and 2000. So uh, that's, that's the range and that's, that's usually called a transition zone or a gray area where we're not really quite sure what to do with an HC, HCG somewhere in that range. If the serum HCG is below that threshold, 1500 to 2000, it's too soon to tell if this could be an ectopic pregnancy. Um, at this point, you want to perform a serial HCG, which essentially entails repeating that test 48 hours later. When you repeat the HCG 48 hours later, if it's a normal pregnancy, it should double. So if HC HCG doubles, then it's likely to be an intrauterine pregnancy. You can continue routine care and you can try to find other causes of the symptoms that that patient presented with. If the HCG does not double in 48 hours, that's a sign that it's an ectopic pregnancy. So this little algorithm helps you determine what to do if there is no gestational sac seen on ultrasound. Now for the management of ectopic pregnancy. We have a couple options here and Many of them are appropriate in all situations. Some of them are appropriate in certain situations. If you have a ruptured ectopic pregnancy, you definitely want to stabilize the patient first with fluid, with blood transfusions, and with pressures, pressors with medications. You then want to take them to the OR for salpingectomy. You want to remove that ruptured tube uh, before it can cause infection or peritonitis. If you have an unruptured ectopic pregnancy, you have a couple of other options. You can still take them to the OR or you could treat with medicine. If you take them to the OR, you can do a salpingostomy. You can still do a salpingectomy. You can still remove the tube. But another option that preserves fertility or that at least attempts to preserve fertility is a salpingostomy, which is essentially an unblocking of the tube. If you meet certain criteria, that's having an HCG of less than 3,000, having a small gestational size, less than 3.5 centimeters, and having no fetal heart tones, you can treat that unruptured ectopic pregnancy with medication. And that medication is usually methotrexate, sometimes with leucovorin. Now it's important to note that this management and that diagnostic tree are both pretty specific to some hospitals. So some hospitals might do it differently, some teams might do it differently. This is presented as the classic teaching for, for one diagnostic algorithm and some management tips for ectopic pregnancy, but this might not be universal everywhere. This is an image of a ruptured ectopic pregnancy in this fallopian tube here. And because it's ruptured, we wanna take this patient to the OR, do a salpingectomy, remove that tube, and close them back up. And this is a before and after, after picture of that same ectopic pregnancy after it's been fixed with a salpingectomy. That's it for this video. This has been a short video on ectopic pregnancy. I hope it was helpful and thank you for listening.